for us of where we are and the help that we need uh, to get through this life and into the next. The Bradleys are leaving this afternoon for Germany. They're going to spend about a week and a half there uh, with their oldest son, Tyler, his wife, and their three grandsons. Uh, and then we'll meet them on June the 21st or June 22nd, I believe, in Croatia. They're going to be, we'll meet them in Frankfurt and then fly down into Croatia and spend a week or so, a little over a week there with Steve and uh, with Keith, my wife, Samuel, me, Andy, and Debbie. So there's six of us that are going. So we desperately need your prayers as we head into that. Joseph, if you could go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint for today. Thank you, sir. Right on cue. And I got the clicker today. Mothers, do you always want your beloved child to run up to you and give you a big hug? Really? I mean, all the time? Even if they've been playing in grease? Or if they've been playing in mud? covered from head to toe, and they just come running at you, Mommy, I love you so much. I love you so much. Give me a big hug. Yeah, we might run the opposite direction. Our action is declaring, you know, if you really love me, you'll go clean yourself up before you hug me. But mothers and fathers don't always run from dirty children, even though they get covered with filth themselves. Imagine this, you hear your child crying out in distress. They've fallen face first into a mud puddle. It's in their face, it's in their eyes, it's in their nose, their mouth, their ears. It's, they can't open their eyes and they're, they're running around blindly looking for you, screaming at the tops of their lungs, tears streaming out and causing little dirt trenches to, to come through there. And they're just crying out, please help me. What do we do then? We take that child in our arms. We don't care about the clothes that we have on. We don't care about any of those other things right now. Our only effort, our only concern is how can we comfort and how can we console that child? How can we make that child feel safe? The child, in essence, is, is, is saying to you, I'm a mess. I can't clean myself. But if you're willing, you can make me clean. And of course you're willing, as any good parent or any good aunt and uncle would do, any good person would do. Today we're going to see how Jesus responds in exactly that way to a leper. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, turn over to Mark chapter 1. Jesus reacting to a leper, and for the Jew, that was the ultimate in uncleanness, being a leper. And this incident, I believe, gives us a beautiful picture of the way Jesus responds to us. And let's bring that on home a little bit further, how Jesus responds to me. When we come to Him, admitting our own inadequacies, acknowledging that He alone can make us clean, and throwing ourselves on His mercy. In this first chapter of Mark, Jesus engages, I think, in two different kinds of ministry, proclaiming the gospel, and then healing and relieving the immediate suffering from the people that he encounters. And in, in addition to that preaching, in addition to that, we see a, a compassionate side of Jesus. We see the compassionate side of God. And this begins in Mark's account with his casting out of a demon, which we looked at last week, and he, who interrupts his teaching. And then, and then it moves for, quickly, forward quickly to Peter's mother-in-law, whom he reaches out and pulls her up out of the bed and heals her completely, compassionate to her plight. And then we see immediately after that that the crowds come to Peter's house and they're, 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 they're pressing in and that, that, that Jesus goes from person to person outside in the street with the people who are needing to be healed and he's casting out demons and he's healing their illnesses. Jesus, if he got any sleep at all, got out of the house extra early in the morning. And he spent some time alone with God in prayer. And I'm persuaded, we're not told what the prayer consisted of, but I'm persuaded that he might have been asking God, you know, 
Why did I come here? While I'm here on earth, am I primarily a healer? Or am I a teacher? Am I a preacher? I'm persuaded, and again, we're not told this, I'm speculating, I'm persuaded that he is asking God for guidance. He's asking God for directions. What is it that you want me to do? And then as Peter joins them that morning, as he's looking for him, he said, everybody's looking for you. And he says, let's go somewhere else. So I can preach there also. And so I believe that God had revealed to him, your message is, your, your, your mission is to preach. And then we move into our story in Matthew, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter one. Let's look at verses 40 through 45. A man with leprosy, I'm reading from the New International Version. I wish I had brought a New American Standard with me this morning because it reads a little bit better. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But instead, and I'm thinking this is David, David White, Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Jesus says, let's go preach. And what does the first thing that he do? What's the first thing that he does? As Mark tells us, he heals somebody else. So which is it, Jesus? Which are you going to do? What are, you going to, are you going to preach or are you going to heal? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. I'm going to do both. And I think the key to understanding this passage is realizing that this story is about much more than a physical healing. In this story, in the next one that we'll read in John, uh, Mark chapter 2, we're going to see how Jesus shows us how he deals with much more than the physical need of the sick person. In the process of healing them, he shows them how salvation, shows us how salvation comes to a sick person. And I think it provides us with a beautiful picture of God's grace, the grace that he extends to each and every one of us. We're going to develop these thoughts by asking some questions. We're going to ask the first question is, what is leprosy? We're going to ask, what does the leper ask? What do the leper's actions and requests tell us about him? What does Jesus do? And what does Jesus command? But the first question is, what is leprosy? As I'm reading this story, we, we would identify leprosy today as Hansen's disease. It comes from the Greek word lepra. We get the word leprosy from that. And, and, and it encompasses, in the Greek word lepra, encompasses more than just what we would consider Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease is one that rots away your skin. It, 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 it turns your skin white. It, turn, it, it rots away to the point where it, it numbs your fingers and it numbs your toes and you, 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 you actually feel nothing in your extremities. And then it, it extends to your, to your facial areas. And it, it's just a gruesome and, and ugly disease that causes your body to rot away. God gave the Israelites specific commands about lepers. This was not just the ones who suffered the Hansen's disease. This is the ones who had maybe a rash, maybe what we would call the shingles, or maybe what we would call, uh, I don't know, eczema, things like that. He says, when somebody displays this type of skin disease, they got to go. They've got to go outside of camp and don't touch them. Leviticus chapters 11 through 15 deal specifically with all this. And it tells us what it means to be clean or unclean in the sight of God. And for the most part, these regulations govern the tabernacle and, or the temple worship. An unclean person had not necessarily committed a sin, 
but they were not fit to worship God. They were not fit to be a part of the congregation. They were not fit to be a part of the church to come together and worship. The central idea of this is that we all have a need to prepare ourselves on God's terms prior to entering His presence. I hope you did that this morning before you came here. I hope it wasn't just, I get up, I take a shower, brush my teeth, put on my clothes, get in the car, and I go. And you don't think about any of the other things that go into this day. That you don't prepare your heart for God's Word. That you don't prepare your heart to minister to God's people. That you don't prepare your soul and your mind and everything about you. is like, what is it that I can learn about God today? And what is it that I can give God and God's people today? And the Bible, throughout all the Bible, has a message for mankind that God is holy. If you remember our scripture this morning from Isaiah chapter 6, that God is holy. God is pure, and that we cannot approach God with a lackadaisical manner. We can't come before God with minds full of lust or deceit or greed or selfishness. We must approach God on His terms and on His terms only. Like the mud-covered boys running to hug their mother, if we truly love God, we'll show it through preparing ourselves for that embrace. And that's the central concept about behind being clean or unclean. And as we've talked about in Leviticus, leprosy is the most serious of all forms of uncleanness. Some forms of uncleanness, such as that which comes from touching an unclean animal or an unclean insect, were cleansed simply by waiting until evening and then going through a ceremonial washing. Basically, let's wash our hands, let's get ourselves clean exteriorly on the outside so that we can go interact with people. Of course, there were a little bit different customs for touching a dead person. There's uh, other uncleanness, which results from childbirth, which required a longer waiting period, and the offerings of sacrifices. But leprosy, leprosy is, is much different. All forms of leprosy, as we've said before, requires the person to stay away from the temple, to stay away from the tabernacle, to stay away from the congregation, to live outside the camp to be cut off from the congregation that is Israel. Lepers had to wear signs of mourning. They could, they could approach no one. They could touch no one. They couldn't comb or cut their hair. They had to tear their clothes up. And if somebody approached them, they had to yell out, unclean, unclean. Let's assume for a minute that this leprosy that we're talking about here in Mark chapter 1 is what we would call Hansen's disease. That this man with leprosy may even be missing some fingers, may be missing some toes, may have pieces of his face that are no longer there. Because you see what happens with leprosy is that it, 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 it kills the sense of touch. And so as you're walking along and you bang your hand on something, you cut and scrape yourself, but you don't feel it. And then it gets infected. And then in time, it just falls off. There was a study in India a few years ago about a leper colony, why so many of them were uh, missing fingers and missing toes. It turns out that when they were sleeping in the night, the rats were coming and gnawing off their fingers and toes. They were sleeping through it. They couldn't feel it. And another terrible side effect of Hansen's disease is that it causes blindness. Not that it causes blindness directly, but because you don't know that you need to blink, you don't blink. And so there's nothing to cleanse that lens. There's nothing that, that, that God has designed that self-healing process that Mike talked about. It doesn't work. And so not only are you blind, but you have no sense of touch. And so you're doubly damned, as it were. Where most blind people have the opportunity to touch the faces of the people that they love, to, to be able to receive that touch or that hug. Not so for the leper. Get away from me. Go outside of a camp, you rotting sack of human 
garbage. That's the mentality of people against lepers. We don't have so much of that today because we do have cures for leprosy. They, oh, it's, it still exists. It's still out there. It's still ugly. But perhaps this man had no sense of touch. He had no sense of, of sight. He had no sense of community. He's alone. Dr. Paul Rand, Paul Brand says this, who, who did that study on the lepers in India, said the loneliest people of all are the ones for whom leprosy has destroyed their sight. Like many others in the world, they are blind, but unlike most of the blind, they can't use their hands to bring them the sensations that their eyes are denied because they can't feel either. They are truly alone. Some commentators and others would say that leprosy is a symbol. It's not the need, it's not of the need for preparation prior to entering God's presence, but as a symbol of lostness. Leprosy is a picture of sin, eating away, going deep into your being, gradually destroying who you are, making you less and less human, destroying all your relationships, and in the end, leaving you alone, despised, rejected, and hopeless. And imagine you're that leper. What does the leper ask? He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Not really a question, more of a statement, isn't it? The leper violated all the rules. You're supposed to be outside the camp. You're supposed to be outside of town. You're supposed to yell unclean, unclean. You're not supposed to be in our presence. And yet here he is. He's thrust himself into Jesus' path. And he's saying, he puts himself on the ground. He humbles himself before our Lord. And he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He doesn't run away. And like the mother welcoming her mud-covered child, Jesus allows the leper to approach him. And he doesn't say, heal my disease. He's saying, I know you have the power to make me clean. And we miss a great deal if we think of this request as the equivalent to heal my disease. The leper is saying, I want to worship God. I want to be a part of God's people in relationship to Him. I want to go to church. I want to be with God's people worshiping God. I want to touch others. I want to be in a relationship with people of God. I want to be holy as you are holy, is what he's crying out. Of course, he wants physical healing, but physical healing is, is, is not the primary here. I want you to heal my soul because it's broken. What do the leper's actions and requests tell us about him? Well, he knows he's unworthy. He has to. He's been told and drummed into his head for day after day, hour after hour. For only God knows how long. You're unworthy. You're a leper. Get out. And he knows he can't heal himself. He can't make himself clean. He's probably never even heard of a leper becoming cured. 
And for years, he's lived with no hope at all. And we're not just talking about the physical part of it. Again, because of the nature of the question, he's, he's, he's not asking for the physical healing. He's saying, I need, I need to be near God and God's people. I need to be clean. And he knows. He knows that Jesus can make him clean. He knows that Jesus can heal the disease. Of that, there's no doubt, because he wouldn't have thrust himself into this picture. He said, I know you can heal my disease. He said, I want you to go beyond that. I want you to make me clean. I want you to be able to help me stand in the presence of God. And the last thing we see about the, 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 the leper is that he understands he has no right to be there. Well, I've been a good Jew my entire life, and I've followed God's commands, and I've done this, and because I'm Jewish and because you're Jewish, you're supposed to heal me. He, he doesn't play any of those cards. He, 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 doesn't come in, he doesn't do anything except throw himself at the mercy of Jesus. He doesn't demand. He says, if you're willing. If you're willing. Not if you're able. He knows he's able, he says, but if you're willing, you can make me clean. And then what does Jesus do? <laughs> Jesus touches him. There are few people on this earth who have touched me physically to the point that I would really like that to happen again. My father-in-law, who's in heaven with Jesus now, is someone I would, I am looking forward to getting hugged by again. I miss his touch. I miss his warm embrace. I miss his arm on my shoulder. I miss him cupping the back of my head and, and drawing me near and telling me how much he loves me. That's our leper here. And Jesus seeing the pain and seeing past the physical deformities and the, the need for the disease to be gone reaches out and touches him. Because that's what our Jesus does. Our Jesus doesn't come up to us and say, oh, unclean, undeserving, get out of here. Stay on that side of the road. Reaches down. Something that this man had longed for, desired for, to once again be embraced by another person. Jesus touches him. It says he is healed and he is cleansed in verse 42. Uh, some of our, our translations may not say that. But verse 42, after Jesus tells him, I'm willing. I am willing. Be clean. He doesn't say be healed. Well, that's what happens. He says, be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Some of, some of our versions say that he was double healed. He heals the disease, and that's secondary to cleansing the soul. And then Jesus makes a command. He says, go show the priests. That seems kind of strange when we read that in verse 44. When I read it, it, see that you don't tell this to anybody, but go show yourself to the priest. Wait a minute. You just, you just made me clean. And that's why he says, go to, excuse me. That's why he said, go to the priest. Because you've been cleansed. Not that you've been healed. 
but that you've been cleansed. Go to the priest. And who are the priests? They're the ones in charge of who gets into the congregation. And the priests have to understand and acknowledge he no longer has this disease which casts him out. The priests are going to perform several ceremonies. They're going to be described in Leviticus chapter 14. A lot of sacrifices. And the whole study of the sacrifices is basically comes down to without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Not that the leper has sinned, and that's why he got the leprosy, because that's the way it was looked at. If something bad happens to you, we brought that up in our class Wednesday night. If something bad happens to you, it's because you sin. This leper hasn't sinned so that God condemned him to have leprosy. Not sure how he got it, but he's there. And Jesus doesn't condemn him. Jesus cleanses him. And those sacrifices, when we looked at them, when we look at them in, in, in Leviticus chapter 14, on the first day, after the priest has examined him and declared that he's been cured, two birds are brought. One is killed over a clay pot filled with clean water. Blood's allowed to drip into the water. And then the priest dips the four objects into the blood of the sacrifice bird, a piece of cedar, a piece of scarlet yarn, a branch of hyssop, and another live bird. And he takes all these things in his hands, he dips it in there, and then he sprinkles the leper seven times. The leper washes his clothes, shaves off all of his hair, even his eyebrows. And then he's allowed to enter the camp. Now notice he's allowed to enter the camp, but he's not allowed to enter his own home yet. He is restored to the community. And he waits seven days to perform some other ceremonies. Seven, I am persuaded, is a symbol of completeness or perfection. And the priest sprinkles him seven times with blood as a foreshadowing of the comprehensive work, the comprehensive sacrifice of Jesus and His shedding of blood for us. I may have failed to mention that the second bird is allowed to fly away. Kind of sounds like another Old Testament sacrifice, doesn't it? Anybody recall the Day of Atonement? What would happen? The high priest would bring in two goats. One he would kill, the other one he would put his hand on it and transfer the sins and the guilt of all the people onto that goat, and then they would shoo that goat out into the wilderness, never to be seen again, a scapegoat. It looks like and sounds like this is at the leper's own personal day of atonement. You are cleansed. That's why he tells him to go to the priest. You asked to be cleansed. You didn't ask to be healed. You asked to be cleansed. Now go to the priest and show them so that you can go through all these ceremonies because you've been asking me. You've asked me, if you're willing, make me clean. You're, you've been asking me to be a part of this congregation again, to be a part of the worship service again, to be one with God again, to be able to go into the temple or the tabernacle again. Do that. Jesus, by doing that, is preaching to the people through that illustration. He's providing an opportunity for the priests and those who witness or hear about these sacrifices to see the illustration, to see exactly what Jesus would accomplish. He says, notice the meaning. There's a sin offering which symbolizes Jesus' atoning sacrifice. There's a burnt offering, which symbolizes God's complete acceptance of us by the blood of Jesus. There's a grain offering that symbolizes our offering ourselves completely back to God. He's telling the leper, go show the priest that you're clean. Partake of the sacrifices. Present yourself to God. You want to be clean. You want to be a part of this. Then go and do what I say and be a part of it again. He's so overjoyed that he loses sight and he just starts blabbering his mouth. We're not told if he ever goes from where he's at. They're in Capernaum. Jerusalem is 100 miles away. You do the math. It took me several days if I'm walking to get there. I found it strange too because 
Jesus tells him to go to the priest. When he tells the, the guy who'd been possessed by demons, Legion, who we saved a, a while back, he tells him, don't get in the boat with me. You go tell everybody what God has done for you. By going to the priest, this man is telling everybody what God has done for him. God cleansed me from leprosy. God made me whole. God made me holy. God may be with the ability to stand in His presence, with the, with the honor and, and the dignity to stand before Him and praise Him for who He is. And what does that mean for us today? Can Jesus make me clean? God is gracious. He is willing to forgive. He is willing to restore our relationships with others. He is willing to heal our relationship to Him. He is ready to cover with the blood all the hurtful and hateful things that have been done to you and that you have done to others. The pain that you have caused, the pain that has been caused to you, all the messes that you've made, God is willing to call you His own, to accept you completely. And are you willing to offer yourself to Him? This morning, if you're a non-Christian, I'm going to tell you something that may take you off guard and it may, it may offend you. I certainly don't want to be offensive because at one point in all of our lives, we were this way. If you are a non-Christian this morning, you're the leper. You're sick. You're sin. And you need Jesus to make you clean. And I promise you that He is able to do that. And I can promise you more than that, He is willing to do that. Christians, we are healed if we have accepted Jesus as our Savior. There may be a part of us we may have come into contact with leprosy. We may have been contacted by sin. Mike pointed to it this morning in his confession to us that he has issues. There's not a single one of us in here who doesn't. I have sin that I readily hold on to, greedily hold on to, will not allow God to have it and take it. Well, I don't want to hear that from my preacher. Brothers and sisters, well, who better to hear it from? I'm not perfect. I'm right there with you, Mike. I'm a sinner. But I am a child of God. I am a forgiven sinner. I have been healed. I have been made clean. I have been made into the image of Christ. Not by anything that I've done, not by any work that I've committed, not by how much money I've given, not by how many times I've been to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, not by how many songs I've led, not by how many sermons I've preached, not by how many times I've spent in prayer, not how much I know. I am not saved by any of those things. I am only saved by the grace of God. Because He is willing. And so I invite you this morning. Be cleansed. Can Jesus make me clean? Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, He can. And again, I'll offer the invitation. So be cleansed. I believe Mike has a song for us. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing as we're led in this song.